So you were country manager for Novell, right? South That's Africa. Right, yeah. And then you moved to the US. What, mm -hmm. what brought you back to South Africa? It's actually the other way around. I became okay. country manager when I came back to South Africa. Okay. Um, then I assumed the country manager role from 2004. So what took you to the US as a starting point? You know, they always say you can, well, they not they, Steve Jobs actually said it, you always connect the dots kind of backwards. You never connect the dots forward. Mm. Um, so no matter what you do, where you are in your life, make sure that what you're doing is absolutely what you love because somehow the dots connect. That's how the dots actually connect. Mm. You know, when the dots are not connecting, it's generally because whatever you're doing is not truly what you love. And, and wherever I found myself, I've been lucky and I've, I've, I've made myself love it and be the best at it. And the resultant is the dots connect. So what landed me up in the United States was a little bit of a guy called Lou Wagman and a little bit of a guy called Eric Schmidt. You know, Eric Schmidt was the CEO of Novell. Yeah. He came down to South Africa, no fanfare, no one knew who he was. It was, uh, it was early days. He had been with Sun Microsystems before. And um, with him was Lou Wagman. And the country manager at the time was sick. I think Richard Beta had some, some illness or something. And I, they, they said, well, why don't you come along? You present quite well, so why don't you join us? And then I went around the country with Eric Schmidt. So I went to Durban, I went to Port Elizabeth, I went to Cape Town, and we got to know each other afterwards. And we had arguments around where kind of the world's going. And, and we really, there was an affinity there. And he could pick up that I really loved what I was doing. I was very mm -hmm. passionate about it. And I was just a good guy. And I think that's, it's not just about being competent. It's about having the right attitude and, and having the right approach and having integrity. And I think when you intermingle those things with a little bit of competency, it's incredible because people resonate with people. Yes. So what happened was um, he left. He left South Africa. And then I got a phone call that said, uh, we'd like you to join a team that we're creating. And this is a team of, you know, we've got infantry, we've got the Navy, we've got everything. But what we want to build is the Delta Force team. And it, what, the, what it was was folks that had the ability to articulate business propositions on a, an executive suite level, but can also speak to engineers and coders on a, on a, kind of on a, on a, on a coding level, on a technical level. And they wanted folks that had that hybrid skill. And what they had picked up without me knowing was that they identified me as one of those guys. And I, I had the ability to get up on stage and then also had the ability to sit down with developers and really commune with them. And uh, they established this team called the Corp Global Corporate Technology Strategist Team. And we were, we were reporting into Lou, and Lou was reporting into Eric, and we went around being responsible for engaging with Novell's largest clients in the world sure. um, on an executive level. And then I got the Rocky Mountain District after that, uh, which gave me the tornado belt in, in the United States. And then I had Latin America. And then they gave me Southern Europe. Then I, they said, well, why don't you just do the smile, right? So why don't you go from you know, North America down to South America and then stop over in South Africa, stop over in the Middle East, do Southern Europe, and then come home. And that was my territory for a couple of years. I did that. Um, and it was, it was amazing because that was, to me, where I did my, my MBA. It, it, you mm -hmm. know, I engaged very deeply with telcos in Brazil. Then I went over to government officials in France. And then I'd be in the Middle East at Saudi Aramco dealing with, you know, that cultural effect. And, and that was a diversity that I was exposed to that I think really helped me. And even today, it helps me. It helps me when I'm engaging in meetings, understanding people, understanding that we all come from completely disparate, disparate walks of life. And the way w we look at things mm -hmm. is so dis different. And I, it's not about judging. It's about actually appreciating and actually learning that and, and utilizing that, 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 uh, that approach uh, to your benefit. So that's what I did. And then I worked very closely with the developers. I got very deeply involved in the open source software movement. And there's a lot of articles about that. Um, I was very involved with Novell acquiring a company called SUS, which is okay. an open source software company, which was doing big global open source software stuff. And it was really cool being in no at Novell in the United States because working for Eric meant we met. I mean, I met Steve Jobs twice. I met uh, Scott McNeely. I met, uh, you know, the names. I could roll them off my tongue. And it, was, it wasn't because I was anything. It was just luck. You know, Eric liked me. He employed me. He took me to the States. And... There I was in the United States, and they gave me all these territories. And, and one of those key responsibilities was to sit down with Eric, with these leaders. And, and he'd be at a, on a Gartner at a, on a stage, and he'd be fielding questions. And if there was anything too technical, he'd deflect to us. So okay. he'd say, hey, Stafford, so what, what's your thought on this? And then we'd step up, and we'd give the more technological view of it and step back again. And it was great. I mean, like I said, I, met, I got to meet Steve Jobs in a one specific incident that was so beautiful because, you know, it was... It was, I, I really revered the guy, mm. and I got to actually sit across the table from him, which was amazing. What brought you back, back to South Africa? Um, you know, I, I, I started, I'll, I'll tell you what my original passion is and what I always wanted to become. 
I was a rescue helicopter pilot. Okay. <laughs> I really wanted to become a rescue helicopter pilot. And, and I don't know, that I just never got to it. Um, I've done my pilot's license. I fly. I've got my MPL. I've got my private pilot's license. And I do it recreationally. But I've always wanted to fly, you know, like these big Chinooks with you know, double rotors across an ocean with large waves and saving people. I don't, it was really a passion. I really wanted to do that. And, yeah, I, I came back to South Africa thinking I want to focus more on family. And I wanted to focus more on giving back to South Africa also. It, I just felt it was the right time for me. The, this, the United States, the technology thing had kind of run out, and I thought going back, I could do more. And the whole notion of open source, I was so deeply involved in that. I had this view of South Africa constantly in the back of my mind when I engaged in open source. And I thought, yeah, if I go back to South Africa, I could do something about this. I could uh, proliferate. I could push the movement. And I thought we could be the originators of a lot of that stuff. And, and coming back to South Africa was, was fun. You know, the free and open source software movement was being run from South Africa. The academic uh, institutions in South Africa had quite a few individuals, you know, the universities. And um, those people were leading FOSS globally from here. So break, down, break down the kind of the fundamental philosophy behind kind of open source. Well, it's, uh, it's the notion that, you know, the, the bare, the core, core philosophy is, is, is quite controversial because it states the crowd is wiser than the individual or a group of individuals. Um, it's based if you could, there's a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, and the guy has this uh, hypothesis, and actually it's based upon a thesis that someone wrote in the 1700s, and it was someone that studied societies and structures of societies and innovation and leadership, etc. And they did a very quick synopsis of a fair. You know, they went to a fair and they got a bunch of butchers together and they slaughtered an ox, and they asked the butchers that were experts at slaughtering ox, what was the net weight if we slaughtered this ox? What would the net weight of the meat be? And they gave their inputs, and then they asked the crowd as they were buying tickets just to guesstimate. What would be the net weight? And then the crowd kept on going through the turnstiles, and the average input from the crowd was within five pounds. The experts were out by 60, 70 pounds. Mm. So he came up with this notion that collectively, if we all participated in solving a particular problem, that the collective would be much more powerful than the individual, etc. And now we have the internet, and now we have connectivity, and the collective is being unlocked. So we have abundant, latent human capital that we can suddenly employ and on aggregate apply to some of our biggest challenges. And open source is a derivative of that. It's people from different walks of life. Now remember, to have a wise crowd is a mechanism. The book posits this, that you need three things. You need diversity, you need geographical dispersion, and you need a method to aggregate. So why diversity? Well, we all look at things differently. The way a Japanese guy builds a car is very different from the way a German builds a car because of our educational systems, our culture, et cetera. Um, uh, physical dispersion. Why? Because when you and I sit in a room, we look at a problem, we contaminate each other. Mm. And you say, I don't think so. Eh? Then I look and I go, mm, probably not. But when we geographically disperse, there's no notion of you contaminating my view. So my approach is organic, it's new, it's fresh all the time. Now you combine those two assets, diversity with non-contamination, and you give it a method to aggregate, then you get personifications like open source where people are building like incredible software packages and services. And right now, the world in the ether is being run by open source software. You know, cloud is open source. Um, so all the biggest systems in the world today are being run by products, services, technologies that are built by the crowd, not a particular group of experts and neither a company, which is it's, it's counterintuitive, but it's quite incredible um, that those notions are arising. So I think we s we're seeing that not just in open source software. We're seeing it in the democratization and the flattening of the world in, in every regard, right? The way content gets created. It's in a very open source software manner. The way artists are now engaging with the crowd, it's no longer multi layers of record label companies between them and they, they manage to get to the crowd. We, we're seeing it in, in medical, we're seeing it in transportation, we're seeing it, you know, now we're seeing democratization of systems, which gives us Uber. You know, Uber is nothing. Uber doesn't own the payment system. It doesn't own a navigation system. It doesn't own the phone. It doesn't own the car. It doesn't. Own it, but it's the biggest transportation company in the world. World, yeah. So this is what we see happening right now: is this unlocking of abundance um, because of this connectivity, this collective. If you've just tuned in, this is Life with Kojo Buffer, and this evening we're joined by Stafford Massey, engaging on the future of technology. Uh, so when you came back, I mean, the idea is to mm -hmm. be, you know to focus on family and focus on different other aspects of, of your life. And you know, and then you become the person who's the first head of Google South Africa. Yeah. Um, you know, 
firstly, don't you tire of, because that's like a label that's just been put on you and it is, always yeah. feels like the first reference point. Yeah. But, you know, how do you come home with a particular idea and then end up in that space? You know, what's interesting is that the Google thing was a, I didn't, because uh, it was a mistake. But again, the dots connect backwards. Uh, you know, I told you about Novell and Eric and, and what happened with Eric while I was in the States. Uh, Eric Schmidt went to Google. So he joined Google. And we were like, back then, why would you go to Google? There's Ask Jeeves, there's AOL. There's, like, why would you possibly go to that company? And clearly, Eric had, was very visionary and he saw it. And um, we didn't. And when I came back to South Africa, I was with Novell, became country manager. A journalist sat down with me, Karen Berman from IT Web, she sat down with me and she said, you know what, Google's been looking for 18 months for like a head. And I said, what? But Google is here. I sent an email to a friend that's very good friends with, with Schmidt. And Schmidt was at um, Google. And I, I said, Dave, you know, a journalist sat down with me today and said, you guys are looking for a country head in South Africa and you're starting a presence in Africa. But you're here already. What's this all about? Just generally, just chatting. I remember sending it on a BlackBerry. Um, and then I got a reply saying, um, don't know, Eric. And then Dave replied back and he CC Derek Schmidt. And then Eric forwarded that email to Google London and the rest is history. They then a guy called Mohammed Gordat contacted me and said, Hey, um, we were looking for someone, Eric and a couple of guys are really recommending you yeah, fly up to London. I flew to London and eighteen interviews later I got a laptop and instruction to go start <laughs> Google in South Africa. And I was like, Okay, cool. I'll go and do it. And I ran Google out of my house for nine months. I mean, people didn't even know Google was here, and I was running it in my house. And it was great because there was no Google Maps that was, was localized in South Africa. There was no Google Search that was localized. Uh, YouTube wasn't localized. There was a lot of these services that today are here, and it's, it's fun to say that I, I was a little bit a part of that. You know, we went around buying map data. We engaged with Toyota with the Priuses to, to do the, uh, you know, the, 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 the view on uh, you know, the maps, mm -hmm. the local view where you can actually see the uh, street view. It's three in its infancy. I fought for that to come to South Africa earlier. Then the World Cup was a big driver for us to get more of the services down here. And so Google Maps became a lot more customized, et cetera. So it was fun. And I left Google, yeah, for many reasons. I think um, I, I, I've disclosed in the media because there was a lot of uh, speculation around, like, how could you leave Google? Like, who does that? Well, I, I actually did. I think I was off the rails personally. You know, I, uh, my marriage wasn't really working. I, I, uh, I had given so much to my career, and Google was this kind of climax to it all. From a professional corporate mm -hmm. achievement perspective, I couldn't have gone higher than Google, right? I mean, I started Google in South Africa, and that label still follows me today, but I guess it's okay. Um, but I'm being known more for what I'm doing today, and, and I'm, I'm getting that more. Like, people will bump into me and go, you're that guy that built the payment pebble, right? Um, or the, and that's pleasing. So I am kind of slowly metamorphosizing. But look, it's, to be associated with Google has, has been a privilege. I mean, that organization was incredible. And I learned a lot of core principles in that organization. I mean, one thing around hiring people and building teams, I must be honest, Google taught me that. And I've got the saying now around hiring people. You know, I don't, I don't hire people outside of this. I, I say I choose insane passion, perpetual positivity, intermingled with integrity over any level of competency. So I don't go for people that just say they are good. You know, we look for people that show in their personal capacity ability to not only overachieve but to share the achievement so when a guy walks in and he says i do i scuba dive i fly i do we go tick 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 cool bye bye but when a guy says i scuba dive i'm a dive master in this particular category and i've taken these two disadvantaged kids and i'm, I'm in my spare time i'm teaching them and, and soon they'll be there we're looking for people that did that yeah. you know and that showed leadership that showed giving sharing um and competency in a particular discipline and when you hire people like that then you don't manage them they just kind of get on with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what Thumbs Up is today. I've got a team of individuals that are incredible um, because I've hired them on that principle. They don't need management. We don't have HR. Um, half of them hate sunlight, don't make eye contact, are antisocial, <laughs> but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that uh, you know they're, they're really, really capable people. How did you get to the payment space? Because, I mean, it's mm -hmm. been interesting watching, you know, because we've interacted and we know each other, mm -hmm. but just watching that transition. And mm -hmm. it 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 felt very organic in terms of how you ended up in the payment space. Yeah. But that's from the outside kind of looking in. How did you end up in that, you know, picking kind of yeah. that space as your area? When I left Google and I, like I said, I, I had this, uh, I, I attempted to, to do a lot, right? I attempted to fix a lot of personal things in my life and really kind of look more personal and inward and do some introspection because I had done amazing things in my career, but I was an, I was an amazing failure in my personal life. 
And I really wanted to kind of fix that. So as I was focusing a lot on that part of my life, I realized that in my career, I had done almost every sphere of technology, but there was one sphere that I, I wasn't in. And I kind of knew that this was going to be big, that I, I looked at the Google engine and I looked at the Google advertising engine and I realized that this wasn't sustainable that true transaction enablement was the new revenue model moving forward. It wasn't just about displaying an ad, getting to a consumer, but it was actually you know, really turning that into a sale. And that turning it into a sale was all about transaction enablement. And today it's all about that. Right? I mean, think about it. The, the joy of an Uber isn't just the fact of the ease of use of utilizing it. It's the fact that you're not engaging with a payment machine in an Uber. You, know, you get in, you get out, and payment just happens. And that invisibility, that that transparency, that, that inference-based engagement with technology is where I saw payment was going. So I sat down and I read a lot and I kind of scratched and I realized that I had been in corporate with Novell. I had been in the kind of the outside the firewall stuff with Google and, the th and, and, and I was in telecom in my early days and dimension data. So I'd done the integrator thing, the large network thing. Then I went away and understood how software was being made at Novell and how to be an ISV and I understood how the IHV, the hardware world worked. And then I came all the way full circle and I understood this, this big Google.com stuff. And the stuff that I didn't know was the transaction stuff. Like how do banks and their pipes work? And, and I started digging. I started digging and I found it extremely fascinating. And I, and I fortuitous, fortuitously, I recognized that what was inevitably going to happen was this focus on transaction enablement. And today the world, to be honest with you, the big shifts in the world right now, the power shifts, organizationally speaking, is transaction enablement. It's all about the fight for the store value. You know, will it be the telco? Will it be the bank? Will it be the over-the-top player? Everyone's looking for the store of value. So it's, it's fortuitous, again, that I, I kind of saw that, and now I'm in that space. And I'm in the space of transaction enablement and financial inclusion. And I mean, it's, it's interesting because if you fix payment, you save lives. You know, that, that's what I've discovered. And, and that's why I've created Thumbs Up. I didn't create Thumbs Up on the basis of wanting to sell more stuff or dominate market share or even a technological vision. I did see payment was broken. It was an interest of mine, but there was one particular experience where a lady lost a baby because she couldn't make a payment. Sure. And uh, you know, her water and lights and her, uti her, uti her utilities were switched off. She gave birth to twins. Uh, she she uh, had a wallet, she had a card, but she couldn't make the payment because she was hurt during childbirth. They switched off her utilities and due to exposure, she lost one of her twins. And I thought that can't happen. So, and, and, uh, and that's fundamental. My company is not based on innovation. It's not based on market share and, and opportunity. My organization is built on a conviction. And I think that, that that is more sustainable. And I always say this, there's two types of entrepreneurs in the world, right? There's the innovative entrepreneurs and then there's the inventive entrepreneurs. The innovative guys build mobile application development companies. They don't own the phone, they don't own the network, and it's great, and we have a lot of them. But there's a few inventive entrepreneurs, and I live in that domain. We build stuff that hasn't existed before. It's a very difficult world. It's a world where it's revered what we do, but it is, f if you ask any world, anyone in this space, the inventive entrepreneur space, everyone will tell you in this space, don't do it. I actually discourage people. I always say entrepreneurship is glamorized, but it's a lie. You know, it's, 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 it's fraught with failure. There's, it's 99.999% failure, and then you get the Bill Gates, yeah. and then you get a this, and you get a that. And I'm luckily in South Africa in that context, I've been successful, but my, the, what I've given up if someone had to sit me down and say, this conviction that drove you, what you sacrifice to achieve what you've achieved, would you do it again? I don't know. But what does give me payback is that what I've sacrificed, what I've given up, the time I wasn't with my family, I haven't seen friends, the things where, you know, sleep deprivation, nerves, uh, psychological impacts, etc. that goes with this. Yeah, at the end of the day, when you see that person that can make a payment, or you enable that business that... You know, the mama that comes to your office and rings the bell and says, I just want to find the guy that made this payment payable. Because you know what? Today, my business is this, and she's got tears in her eyes. That's what it's all about. And passion doesn't live in this world. People say, be passionate mm -hmm. and be positive and love failure. And let me tell you something. If you're an innovative entrepreneur, do all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, be passionate, love failure, and learn from. Well, when you're an inventive entrepreneur, passion runs out. It's crap. <laughs> Positivity runs out very quickly. Failure. You, you petrified of failure. This world is a very different world. This world is, is about conviction because what's going to get you out of bed every day is the fact that you're driven by saving a life. That if I can do this, something like this will definitely save lives. And 
And yeah, I mean, you and I were at an event the other day and we saw quite a few of these conviction-led businesses, right? So, and that's what I'm interested in. So in my personal capacity, I also invest. And I invest in startups that can tell me about their conviction, less about their idea. And that's what gets me out because I get equally passionate. So the people that work at Thumbs Up don't work there because they're going to make a better, cooler payment pebble or a payment blade and do all the things that we're doing right now. They work there because they understand that the origin of this organization was a conviction to save a life. And if we fix payment, we save lives. And that's what I always ask entrepreneurs. You know, what's the conviction? What are you trying to do? Sell more mobile apps. You know, make more money. You know, I'm not. Th there is a group of people that will fund you, and you probably will be successful. And good luck. I'm in the world of if I do this, it fundamentally changes lives, and and that's that's the more interesting area. So yeah, it's a long way to answer that. So payments for me is where I found my conviction, okay. and and transaction enablement and the and the financial services world is where I discovered it, and uh, I've never been more happy in my career in terms of the technology that I've been exposed to and the impact that I believe I can have. And you know what's interesting is the impact that we're having in South Africa is having a global impact. You know, we're, we've launched this now overseas. It's having incremental impact. We, we, we're going all over the world right now. And we're discovering that what we built originally as a conviction is actually a, a problem all over the world, mm. and and we're leading. And, and what we have, there's nothing like it in the world. And there are people that are trying to copy what we're doing, but they're innovative entrepreneurs. They just they're seeing the market opportunity, so they're building stuff. They could never compete because we don't compete. I always tell my team, we're not into, I mean, the meeting before this, an executive from a very large blue chip South African organization asked me about a competitor. I said, look, I don't compete. I organically make based on a conviction. And that's div that should be different to you. And then it is. And that's what people follow. So, yeah, then you can have a leaderless organization if you built it on conviction because conviction is actually the leader, not mm -hmm. you. Uh, this is Life with Kojo Buffo and Kai FM 95.9. And this evening we're joined by Stafford Massey. Um, whose company Thumbs Up has created the Payment Pebble, um, as well as, I think, the Blade now. Yeah, the Payment Pebble. Um, what's, what's the difference between the two, in terms of Pebble and the Blade? Yeah, so we, we, we built the little, again, connect the dots backwards stuff, right? So you keep doing something sincerely and with passion, and it's just amazing how the dots connect backwards. We, we created this little device, I mean, the Payment Pebble. Go take a look at it. It's 50 rand a month. You can get it from APSA. It's cheap. You plug it into your mobile device through an audio socket, and uh, whether that's your tablet or your smartphone, and it converts it into a card acceptance machine. So now the guy that fixes your gate, that welds, that fixes your pool, welds your this, fixes your plumbing, those folks are non-technical. Um, they generally can't afford the tools, and the tools are not fit for purpose because those guys are mobile and they move around. So what we, when we built the little payment pebble, we focused on those guys. We said, hey, you know, there's a big market here for them, so let's do that. And um, lovely, we have thousands in South Africa. We're the dominant player here now. We have you know, a lot. I probably can't disclose those numbers because we are under NDA with Apps. But with the dominant player over here, we we transact. I'd say north of 85% of all mobile uh, point of sale transactions is done by our device um, because it's so simple. You take it, you plug it in, you load and launch a mobile app, it just works. We've had other things pop up that do Bluetooth, and the problem is there's no sustainability on remote. You know, y my device, take it out the box, no training manual, you plug it in, it just works. And I think the cost plus the simplicity. Um, took us four years to get there. <laughs> so what people see in there, there's a couple billion rands worth of investment in that product. Okay, that's a lot of, lot of non-passion, lots of negativity, <laughs> and a lot of giving up is in that product. To get it to a point where it is as simple as it is today. Its size, its form factor, its ergonomics, its simplicity took a lot. It really took a lot. I mean, I almost gave up a couple of times, but we finally got there. And then when we put it into corporate players' hands, you know, enterprise customers looked at the little payment pebble and they loved it. And they said, wow, you guys have actually squashed a little big payment machine into that form factor, plug it into a smartphone, great. But the problem is with this thing, you know, I am, I am a delivery company. I'm a logistics company. I'm a large company that has lots of dr drivers. And what we discovered, fortuitously, again, is that most enterprise customers have the same challenge that a plumber has that services you. You know, a plumber needs to take your money. He comes to your house, he fixes something, he says it's going to cost 200 rand. He s lands up 11 p.m. having ripped half your wall, but actually fixed the problem, and it's a 2,500 rand problem. Now you have to drive to an ATM, and it's complex, etc. Or he writes on a piece of paper, then you don't pay him because you forget. So it's very hard for him. So the payment variable solves that. 11 o'clock at night, he plugs in the phone, he takes the payment electronically, your card payment. Guess what? Enterprises have, in principle, that exact same problem. The largest enterprises in South Africa today, their number one challenge is their businesses. Yeah, digitization, all these cool things, but it's cash. Cash is causing the death of people in some organizations. 
right? And there's drivers that are moving cash around that are get targeted, get taken out. We hear it on the news all the time. Cash is the competitor. If you're going to ask me who's the big challenge, it's not another guy across the road. It's cash. Yeah. The cash problem is massive. So what we discovered is enterprise customers have the same problem. So they took the payment payroll and said, hey, wait a minute, we can give this to our delivery driver. We can give it to our sales guy. We can give it to our insurance agent to collect it. But when they plugged it in, they realized that they needed thousands of smartphones. Mm. Complex, not fit for purpose. Um, smartphones evaporate when you leave them somewhere. They just disappear. <laughs> Um, uh, they, uh, they're very expensive. They require management tools, um, et cetera. So we went away and said, why don't we build our own smartphone? So I just, all our guys, I, it was a shower moment. I sat there and I thought, I listened to this enterprise customers telling me, I love, I love this little payment payroll, but it's at the end of the day, because I have to plug it into a smartphone. It's too expensive. Um, I don't like the end user license agreement of the application store. My risk people are saying that you're bound to Apple or you're bound to Android. Mm -hmm. Um, my guy can take it home and his kid installs games on it and breaks it, doesn't work, so support nightmare. The battery dies so quickly when he's out in the field because it does all that other stuff that it shouldn't do, social media. And at the end of the day, when I plug it in, my cardholder won't pay because he doesn't trust this dongle plugged into a phone. He says, aha, uh -huh, I'll do an EFT. So we walked away and we said, what if we built our own smartphone? And I actually came to work one morning and I broke a smartphone on the table. And my guys all looked at me strangely and they said, what are you doing? And I said, well, why are we subject to this? And we took a smartphone and we took all the stuff that wasn't relevant to what we were trying to do off the table. And we built from the ground up a foot for purpose mobility platform. And we looked at the price point and suddenly we had a device that was like a thousand rand mm. versus devices out there that were 18 to 20,000 rand. And we looked at each other saying, are we missing something? Like, <laughs> is something wrong? And we kept on going down the wrong road. And now what we have is what we call the payment blade. And the payment blade essentially is a mobility platform. We don't call it a phone because it does a whole lot more than that, but it doesn't. It, it, it steps over those four to five issues that an enterprise customer has. So now when a customer engages with us, we can provide them the payment payable integrated with its own mobility platform. Low cost, fit for purpose, it's our version of Android on there. It's cleaned up, it doesn't have all that social media crap on it. You can customize it, you can secure it down, you can lock it down. Um, the battery is huge in our device. You know, at Mr. Price today, they're running the payment blade. They're doing a couple billion, I shouldn't maybe disclose <laughs> that, but they're doing, they're doing lots of transactions across the device. And uh, you can walk in and go to Mr. Price and you can pay with it. They do queue busting with it. It's one of our biggest uh, r retail customers in South Africa. And um, the battery, lot, the, they're doing over 700 um, transactions on a single charge. Wow. You can't do that with a traditional smartphone. It has no value. It doesn't evaporate. No one's going to run home with my device and start and steal it yeah. or become a target because they have it. You know? um, and also, we give you your own application store. So a whole back office framework where you can customize the device, re you know, send out applications as you wish, revoke them, pause them. It's you completely in your control. And the most important thing is the cardholders love it because mm -hmm. they see it as a modern payment device. There's no reticence to use it. So, again, we didn't, like, we kind of, did this and then we looked at it and said why don't we do it and boom now we have the payment blade and the payment blade we've like i said we've got mr price we're engaging with retail extensively in south africa that's my most i'm busy with that and um, logistics companies are approaching us it's fun you know we have and we've launched it in australia now um, in fact we launched the version two of the product in australia last week yeah. and um yeah the fanfare is quite tremendous there. people don't know about us so you don't see thumbs up's name but in in australia it's called blade pay anz's blade pay um, in South Africa, it's called the APSA Payment Pebble Handset. You never know about my company. Mm. Uh, we are a B2B company. So we enable banks to take products white label to market. So yeah, we're kind of in the dark corner there, just innovating. I mean, I think what's interesting about it is it's, it's creating solutions, like you were saying earlier on, kind of, it's creating solutions for our environment. And, mm. I've, and, I, and I, I find that from an African perspective and sadly within South Africa, there's this desire to create things that compete with what's coming out of Silicon Valley. Yeah. Whereas when you're creating something that is solving, you know, solving a problem that's unique to here, you then discover that, you know, you then discover that actually the world needs it. So exactly. something like, like an M-Pesa where yep. they created it specifically for a Kenyan environment. Bad example, but get the point. Well, yeah, that's well, I mean, because that's not applicable anywhere else well, in the world. That's yeah, the challenge. Well, that's Very unique circumstance. But the point's made. The principle is correct. And this is what I, uh, what I tell, and hopefully people that listen to this, you, you, you don't have to be an entrepreneur, do a little bit of things, and then get a VC in the States and then move to the States. and da -da -da. If you want to be an entrepreneur that's innovative, 
not inventive. If you want to be the innovative entrepreneur that builds the next social media platform with a, an app that people click the like button, go to the States. Go have fun. Go make tons of money. And the world's your oyster. Good luck to you. We need people like you. It's awesome. Mm. But are you an inventive entrepreneur that looks at changing lives and, and, and making things that don't exist in the first place? Africa couldn't be a better test bed for your technology. You know, when you build things in a, in a world where, you know, broadband is prolific, you know, the LSMs have the affordability to buy smartphones and, and, and just go with you. Everyone's educated. There's, there's a single language, or maybe two languages. That's it. Um, when you live in a domain like that, you, there's no mother of invention notion there. Mm -hmm. You know, you come to South Africa. Come build it, yeah. When you build it, yeah. Number one is, how much does it cost? Number two is, can I go anywhere I want with this thing? Does it require energy? What are its energy requirements? You know, um, does it require training? When I get this thing, what, how does how does it, you know, if you jump through the hoops that Africa presents to you, and Africa is crap, it's hard, it's horrible, but you know what? If your product works here, it works anywhere in the world. And so we did that when we focused on we focused on two things. If we could make it work here, we knew we had replicity. So when we example, we've just engaged in in the Indian market and in the Asia Pacific market, and when we go there, people say, "How many devices do you have in South Africa?" And we answer them, "They go in South Africa." They say yes, and we take it out and we show them. And they, then the question of viability for their terrain goes away immediately. Because, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? If it works there, we're not going to ask you questions anymore. Then they go into the commercial model very quickly. So that's been so satisfying for us, going to the northern hemisphere. There's no question about our scale. Can you scale? How big can you scale? How applicable is your device to the consumer base and the, and, and the base that you're selling into? So so we it was difficult doing it, yeah. But because we did it, yeah, we have massive differentiation. So our so-called competitors haven't been subject to those things, so we compete easily with them. They don't have the ability to scale. The products require deep learning, mm -hmm. and, uh, so, and so, so that's what we did here. And then we went to Australia, and Australia presented another challenge. It was one of the most sophisticated financial services markets in the world, which means their regulatory frameworks were extremely arcane. And we said, look, if we can do it in South Africa ter terrestrially, let's go do it in Australia, because if we could do it there, then we could do it legislatively then no company in the world would ever question us if we came into their country. And that's yeah. what we've done. So we launched in Australia. We're the, one of the biggest in Australia. We're the biggest in South Africa. We jumped all those hoops. Now in the Northern Hemisphere, we're launching in the United States at present. We're about to go to market in Asia Pacific um, from Hong Kong into seven countries over there. And we're engaging in India now quite, quite extensively. And again, it's been easy because all the questions that they ask us, we laugh at. In fact, we go home every night with my solution architects and we laugh because... And, and some of the customers find it hard to deal with us because there is no question that they ask us if we can't answer that. Because we know every single one of the challenges that they're going to put in front of us, and we've overcome them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's refreshing. It's fun. But it's horrible in the beginning. It's really, really, really hard. And that's why. But don't leave. Don't leave South Africa. Don't. Because if you want to prove what you're doing, if you want to prove that it has human applicability and it can scale and you can make a business out of it, if you do it, yeah. You can do it anyway. And, and that's the value that Africa does present. And now we have, guess what we've done, right? So I started the company. I funded it. I got a venture capital firm involved. Um, they kind of believed in me, went with me, went with me. We built it, built it, built it, failed tremendously. Built it, built it, built it, built it. And uh, last year, December, we closed a deal with Visa Inc. So Visa Inc., the blue chip you know, financial services company, one of the biggest in the world, bought an equity stake in my company. And, 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 you know, we raised a, a significant amount of capital, and that's enabled us now to execute in the Northern Hemisphere. Why did they come in? Because we proved legitimacy in South Africa from a terrestrial perspective, and we proved legitimacy that we could operate irrespective of regulatory frameworks uh, in the world because we've proven ourselves in Australia. Australia. Yeah. Okay, you're tuned into Life with Kojo by Fun Kai FM. Um, I'm chatting to Stafford Massey, who's had a, a, a rich history in, 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 your, in the world of tech, in the world of business. Um, we've been chatting about his, his business, but what I'd like to shift to is, I know something that you've always considered very important is this understanding of coding and <laughs> coding, yeah. you know, coding in, you know, within our context as well, um, to the point where you, I think, believe your, your children can all code and yeah, you, yeah. you got them doing it from very, very early. Very young, yeah. um, what's the importance of that? You know, I, I find in South Africa, we have many people that speak about technology, but then, then don't code. Now, there's an argument that says that you, you, don't, you, know, you don't need to go to understand. I, I get that. But to truly organically understand where things are going, to truly understand, truly, to have your finger on the pulse, you have to have coded or be coding. 
um, I have a very deep coding background, and it's it's where I come from. When so you say coding, what do you? Software you development, okay. firmware development, hardware, firmware development. Um, when I sit down and I I don't code anymore, I'm not good enough anymore. <laughs> I've got these people around me that are just I thought I was a coder, and then I met real coders. Um, but the f the fact is that these these guys around me can speak to me, and coders don't talk to people; they only talk to special people, right? They really, really do. And and I've learned to build an organization where I can harness this this capability. And when I look at what they're building and how they go about it, I deal with people that code, and because I deal with people with code, I take what they make and I productize it, and 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 that's the skill set that I present in the room. So I can they've got great ideas. They can code, but but I do believe to understand the shifts on a tectonic basis, what's helped me is the fact that I can see under the covers and I understand what's happening under the covers. So when I get up on a stage and I share my posits around where the world of technology is going, example, I tell many people, the future of the internet is the disappearance of the internet. The future of technology is its dissipation. What do you mean by that? So uh, yeah, l l l let's take a step back. When electricity was discovered, the first time people monetized electricity was when they touched it. You know, it was it was hackers, you know, developers, coders. They took the electricity and they rendered it in in, in a Tesla's arc way, in fares in the tent behind the tent. So you went there, you paid a penny, and you touched Tesla's arc, and you walked out, and you were like, "Wow, my hair raised, check flip." It was mystical, domain of the few, but that was the first time electricity was monetized. Then um, hackers, people hacking it. And then electricity became a fashion symbol. Hackers were employed by rich people downtown Manhattan. When you slept with the lights on, it depicted that you were wealthy. You know, ambiency was a reflection of affluency. And then something happened to electricity. So it went away from being a domain that was secretive and mystical. And then it became a fashion symbol. So it was still in people's basements being made loud and horrible, smelly, no standards, no nothing. And, and, and it was a fashion symbol. When it truly had its impact on the Industrial Revolution was when electricity dissipated and disappeared. So it went out from people's, out from tents and the mystical. It went out from people's basements and only the wealthy. It got put onto a wide area network. So we created a, an electrical grid or let's call it a cloud, mm -hmm. right? So it moved out of the basements and we, we, we figured out how to convey it over vast distances. So we created electric, electrical grids. Today we call it the cloud um, in principle. And then we created a standard to tether to the cloud, ACDC. I'm being you know, uh, facetious, but ACDC. So you could tether onto this cloud. And then we had a permanent utilization. Those three things resulted in the disappearance of electricity, but it's prolific um, distribution. Now we have electricity everywhere, everywhere, right? But we don't un not all of us understand how it works and how it gets here. Yeah. Yeah, we don't understand the mechanism of the filaments and how the resistor actually generates heat and gives us. We don't understand. Most of us don't. We just want it. We use it. We switch the lights off and we walk out. It's become everywhere. It's, in, it's on you right now, Kojo. It's in your watch. It's in my watch. It's in our phones. It's in, our, it's in that mouse. It's in that camera. It's, in, it's everywhere, but it's nowhere. And that's the future of technology. So let's come bring it back to today. Um, when, when, uh, let's take geo. You know, the geo, the function of geo, the technology of geo. The first time we ever engaged with geo was how? The map book. Yeah. Yeah, it was physical. It was like people touched as us. You touched geo in a book. In your cubbyhole, you open the cubbyhole and you look where you are. A seven, the grid, and then you figure out where you are. And no battery, no visual UI, static, atomic. You touch it. Then a jump, major jump was, you know, TomTom, Tom, Garmin, Google got involved, and then suddenly mapping geo was rendered beautifully visually to us. Mm. Um, now we have annotated maps. We got Google Maps. We got uh, Apple Maps. We got p maps everywhere. I mean, I'm sitting here with my watch that has maps inside of it. You know. Ways and um, beautiful things. So, what's the future of geo? A prettier geo, um, better annotated geo map? No, it's the Google autonomous driving vehicle. It's the blind guy. That's how they advertise the Google self-driving car. It was the blind guy getting into the car and saying to the car, "Take me to Taco Bell." He did not engage with it physically. Mm -hmm. He did not engage with it visually. He engaged with it experientially in an inference-based manner. See, when technology becomes consequential. When technology is not the core focus, when its function is employed behind a desire, then it has its impact. And that's how electricity became an impact on the Industrial Revolution. Technology is about to do that because it's dissipating. It's everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Before, when you bought a PC, it was a big, fat thing with a tower and a keyboard and a mouse and 
you went home and the thing screamed when it connected to the internet and you knew what a good scream was versus a bad <laughs> scream. <laughs> and, uh, you bought software to, and you took disks out and you fed this page, disk, this tower, and it was, wow, wow, wow. It was an incredible experience. Domain of the few. Only corporates could give people that and some rich people had it and some kids had it, etc. But then where did it go from there? You fast forward to today. You go to an Apple store, you go to a Samsung store, you buy a tablet, you walk out. There's no external keyboard, there's no external mouse. Um, you give it to a two and a half year old kid. The kid doesn't even know how to read yet, but knows how to touch and do gesture orientation and have a deep immersive experience mm. without engaging deeply with technology. See, when, when there's no external mouse, external this, and there's hundreds of thousands of applications. So you see how when technology dissipates, then it becomes more prolific. And we're seeing that. I mean, Uber is a personification of it again. You know, um, the iPod should have lost against the Sony if it was about technology. The Sony had buttons and equalizers and things yeah. spinning, and here comes this monochrome thing with a single turn button, and all the technology is gone, and suddenly it's prolific. See, when technology gets dissipated, when it disappears, then it has its impact. Uh, Uber, from a financial service perspective, is, is exactly that. You walk into, get into an Uber, and you get out. We always thought that Ubers would have better technology in them for payment. Like, I'll tap my phone, I'll scan a QR, and guess what? Now there's no technology yeah. in the cab. It's gone. And let me give you the ultimate personification. Today, I called an Uber this morning, right? Um, and years now, this is where it's going. And this is how truly when technology dissipates has its impact. When I, this morning, while I was tying my laces, I spoke to Alexa on Amazon Echo. I have Amazon Echo running in my house. We have the, um, the, the, um, the Uber module enabled. So you speak to Alexa. So while I was tying my laces, I said, Alexa, Uber, 9 o'clock. Alexa replied saying, Stafford, did you say you want an Uber at 9 o'clock? I say, yes, Alexa. She keeps quiet for a while, and then she says, Stafford, your Uber will be here in four minutes. And she says the Uber driver's name. And I say, thank you. I walk out. I get into the Uber. I jump out at my destination. I have not picked up my phone. I have not engaged in a mobile application. I have not taken my phone out to pay in a better way and I get to where I want it. See, I don't want to engage with technology better. I want to get to my destination. Mm. When I go buy an Amazon book, the reason I keep going back to Amazon is not because of their selection or anything. It's because the payment's so easy. It's the one-click method. Yeah. I go, I select the book, I buy it. I don't get a shopping cart experience. Right? I just get the book. Apple licenses that method from Amazon for the App Store. That's why when you buy a little track, it just downloads. So... What we see is the dissipation of technology and what's happening with the dissipation and the disappearance of it is we're finally getting what it should be doing for us, where it is an enabler. I don't want to experience it better. I don't want to tap my phone and pay better. I don't want to open up a mobile app and experience your business better. No. What I want is the service that you're rendering seamlessly, frictionlessly, quickly. And that's how Uber works. Right? I get in, I get out. I, and, and now we're seeing destination becoming the desire and technology is dissipating between me and my and my enablement for that. I want to go there. I don't want to launch a mobile app to get there better. I don't want to use my phone to pay better while I'm driving there. Yeah. No, I want to get there. And I think that's it. Technology is disappearing. And I think that's the opportunity that presents itself to Africa. Because when technology disappears and it has its impact, you know what it does? It unlocks abundance. Because I was going to ask, I mean, isn't that still the domain of the few? Um, in terms of being able to you know, like you're talking about Uber, you talk about all these different things. And those experiences make sense to me because, you know, we occupy kind of the same the same spaces in society, so I can do all of that sort of stuff. Um, but there's a larger portion of this country and this continent who don't have that access. No, but wait. Because of its dissipation, the prolific access becomes a possibility now. Okay. So you don't have to be educated to access the service. You don't have to own anything. So we're moving away. Let me answer it in kind of a roundabout way. But we, because of technology's proliferation, what we see happening is people don't want to own things anymore. People want to access things. Right? We don't own things anymore. This notion of ownership is dissipating because ownership has a burden. Access has, a, has great benefit. Example, um, I don't want to own music. Before I wanted to have the LP and the this and the that, then it moved to the discs and the CDs. Cool. And then, you know, then I had to go and buy, uh, uh, the, the, you know, let's fast forward, iTunes. 
iTunes has become a burden. I don't want iTunes. iTunes has thousands and thousands of tracks. It's great. But then I have to manage it. And Spotify comes along. Mm-hmm. Pandora comes along. Deezer comes along. I pay these guys three bucks, five bucks, ten bucks a month, and I get all the music that I want, wherever I want, on anything I want, as much as I want. Any Which is why Apple went the other way and went and added Apple Music. There you go. Because people don't want to own things. It's the burden of ownership versus the benefits of access. People won't, don't want to own cars anymore. Why own a car? Uber's slowly starting to ask you that question. The why own a vehicle? Now, there's big industries that are feeling this right now, right? The record label industry, yes. Uh, movie producing companies, transportation, taxi owners are feeling this. Where people are saying, why must I own it? Well, I want to access it. When I want a bicycle in New York, don't own a bicycle. Yeah, just bicycle yeah. share. I pay the city four bucks a month and I ride as much bicycling things as I want. Right, and the, 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 there's 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 uh, the the car rental companies are suffering with this car that uh, this company I forget it, but uh, for the name, but you pay them seventy bucks a month and it's a mobile app and you download it and you just say I've got Kojo with me, want a car? It says okay, give me a second, give me a second. Hey, there's a ten minute walk from here. There's a mm. two door um, little sports thing. Do you want it? Yes. You get in it, you drive as much as you want, you leave it wherever you are, and you walk away. You don't own a car. Yeah. So so we are moving away from owning things. And this is changing the economics of the world. Now, to come back to your question, is that the domain of the few? Absolutely not. Because it's dissipating, its complexity is minimizing. Um, to, to, to become an Uber has never been, I mean, look at what Uber's done. Because technology has dissipated, Uber doesn't own the tracking system, it doesn't own the payment system, it doesn't own the phone, it doesn't own the application store, it doesn't own the vehicle, but it enables all of those things. And I think it, pre- it presents greater opportunity out there versus any time that we've seen before in economic history. Mm -hmm. So participating is now no longer the domain of the few. Participating now no longer, the mystical aspect of it is gone. You don't have to be a coder anymore. You can utilize services disparately all across the world and you can aggregate them and create a business and and have a global impact Mm. because, you know, everyone's connected and et cetera, et cetera. So no, I think it's, the world's never been flatter than it is today. So just to start to wind down, what, what, does the future look like in your eyes? You know, w- w- first of all, from a technological perspective, it's going to be interesting. I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research on uh, the, the scary bits of the technology world, right, where we move away from technology enablement being the bits and the bytes and the phones and stuff. Um, you know, biological hacking is very interesting for me. You know, um, biomimicking is very interesting for me. Um, um, there's a lot of research now and a lot of work going into hacking of plants. And storing data in in, f- in in flora, you know, and using protein cells for data storage, and and using communication through the body. So so becoming less objects that need to be augmented to communicate, and more objects that can organically communicate based upon. You know, it's kind of it sounds a lot like Avatar, right? You touch the tree and you hook your hair into it. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's kind of where we're going. I think that we we're becoming more organic in our connection. And I think we're going to see more and more of this happening. And it's, it's going to challenge a lot of ethical aspects. I mean, I tweeted the other day, uh, they have now simulated, they're using visual reality to help people um, that potentially could do complete head transplants. Right? So if a guy is injured in a, and he's a donor, and he's injured in a motor car accident, it's just his head, but his entire body is still intact. They can remove his head and put your head on there. If oh. you s- you got cerebral palsy, or you got some other disease where you can... So just doing that, and VR helping the guy to understand a new body and, and doing that. And these things are coming. In fact, there's a beautiful quote, the future is already here, just unevenly distributed. <laughs> right? um, that's, I think it's Gibson said that. So, so yeah, it's yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm looking into that. And, and what, I, what I think, what makes me excited about it, I'm not scared about technology because technology is not something to be scared of. I think it's us and technology. It's not technology. We always speak about technology as a thing for them, but uh, a human augmented is a very powerful thing. Uh, from a learning perspective, a healthcare perspective. And, and I think the future is the unlocking of abundance. I'm not, and I'm paraphrasing Peter Demandis' book called Abundance, but that's exactly it. And, and Africa poses that, that opportunity. We, we've got another billion people. That the only next billion people that will be connected will be in Africa. And those next billion people being connected in Africa are being connected in a way where there's no legacy, where there's no contamination, and they're just being brought online. And it's a beautiful thing to watch because I think... That unlocking is not a technological unlocking. That's an unlocking of latent human capital, mm-hmm. latent human capability. And if you go back to the beginning of the conversation, that wise crowds. Now, if you're unlocking all of this, I think what you're going to see coming from Africa is 
entrepreneurs that are inventive, that are technologically augmented, that will solve some of the world's biggest problems. I think you're not going to get the next Facebook from you. I don't think you're going to get the next Twitter from you. I don't think you're going to get the next, you know, the next social media network from you. I think you're going to get the next Google of water purification. I think you're going to get the next Facebook of healthcare from you. You know, you're going to get the next Twitter of financial services coming from you. Simply because what we are focused on here is solving challenges that have deep, humane impact. Because it's not, you know, water here is a challenge. Nutrition is a challenge. It's not a business plan. It's not a thinking. So, you know, Imagine all these latent human minds with all of that capability suddenly augmented with tools and services to coalesce and coagulate around these challenges and then fix them could have a global impact. So in a minuscule way, what we've done with Thumbs Up, imagine, you know, Africans en masse affecting all of that. So I think that I think I think the world's biggest problems will be solved in Africa. I think we'll pioneer that. And that's what's exciting about the next generation of Africa. And this next couple of decades coming. It's not going to be the U.S. and all these G8 countries. I think it's going to be here. And it's because abundance being unlocked is not dependent on government. Abundance being unlocked is not dependent on institutions anymore. You know, we are seeing the democratization and, and the prolific access of, of connectivity. And that's going to be interesting. I mean, uh, technologically speaking, the Internet's changing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're not going to have this relationship with the Internet where you need a fat broadband connection with a thin browser accessing a thick cloud. That's going to go away because of storage on the edge. You're going to be able to store in the next five to eight years everything that's on the Internet today, every single thing that's on the Internet today, all the YouTube videos you'll be able to have in the palm of your hand, all the music ever created, you'll be able to store 85 years of video on your hand. And that what we'll see happening is more an osmotic relationship with the Internet versus a pheromonic relationship. Yeah. So you'll have an entire snapshot of all the data on you, and you'll only heal to the streaming services like Twitter and Facebook, those live streaming services. But the data of the internet, the data that's in the cloud, will be on the edges, prolific. So education, access to knowledge, videos, content, um, is going to be interesting. And, and, and that's going to affect everyone again. But I think uh, Africa is where you want to be right now. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kojo.